I'd like to invite Dr. Giuliano to be kind. And for those of you standing in the back, there are plenty of seats up front if you wish to take a moment to get a seat. Uh, Dr. Giuliano won't be brief. Thank you, Kelly. The, presidential, the, the president elect of your society has very few prescribed functions. The most important function is to get to know the president and introduce him at the annual meeting. Well, it was my pleasure to get to know Kelly McMasters. I got to know a great deal about him. Thank you, Beth. And I learned a great deal from Kelly. I'd like to share some of this with you. Kelly is the Ben A. Reed Professor of Surgery at the University of Louisville. He is chair of the Hiram Polk Department of Surgery, professor of pharmacology and toxicology, and is the new editor-in-chief of the Annals of Surgical Oncology. Kelly has over 400 publications, tech, authored a textbook, was principal investigator of the NCI-funded Sunbelt Melanoma Trial, and is past president of the Western Surgical Association and the Southeastern Surgical Congress. Now, you can get that on the internet, but I'd like to share some other things about Kelly that you won't be able to Google. First, the basics. Kelly was born in Camden, New Jersey. Camden is a small town just across the Delaware River from Philadelphia. It's a town that was once a great manufacturing center, but that, like many towns in the Rust Belt, went away. But there is now a medical school in Camden. It was also the home of Walt Whitman and was visited by Sir Oscar Wilde. Kelly was always a gentleman. He has a twin sister, Michelle, who he let out moments before he did. His parents were Walter McMasters and Janet Conti. I mention that because Janet Conti was a beautiful Italian and American woman, and for some reason, I believe it was from his mom that Kelly got his wit, his charm, and his intelligence. Kelly spent most of his childhood in Atco, New Jersey, which is a very small town. It's a farming community. Kelly has a younger brother, Kenny, his twin sister, Michelle, and a younger sister, Dina. And these were normal kids who grew up in small towns in parts of New Jersey that you may think is a garden state. Kelly loved playing in the woods, picking berries, building tree houses, forts, making slingshots. His idol was Daniel Boone. And perhaps this idolization of Daniel Boone is what ultimately led him to the heart of Daniel Boone country, Kentucky. Kelly might, I think, perhaps be a little too dapper to be an original Daniel Boone. Now, his work experience is hardly the work experience you would expect of a president of this prestigious organization. He did do hard work on his grandparents' farm, and perhaps it was his... Uh, work with the chickens that enabled him to get a job at Kentucky Fried Chicken, or perhaps it was, again, some subliminal lure to Kentucky. For those of you in the audience who are old enough to know what that is, that's a vinyl record. Well, uh, Ke Kelly made them. Kelly went to Colgate University for his bachelor's degree and medical school at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School where he got an MD and a PhD in cell and developmental biology. He then went to the University of Louisville to train with Hiram Polk in general surgery and did a surgical oncology fellowship at the MD Anderson. While at Louisville, Kelly met a beautiful ICU nurse, Beth Hendrickson. Beth decided nursing wasn't right for her and went to Louisville Law School and started a very prestigious firm in Louisville McMaster's Keith and Butler that defends hospital and physicians in malpractice. They met caring for a patient in the ICU with Melina. There must be something very romantic about Melina that I missed <laughs> uh, because they were married soon after. They have three sons, Austin, Stephen, and Owen. And that beautiful child, El Owen, was lost to leukemia a few years ago. After fellowship, they went back to Kentucky and settled in Louisville. 
Kelly soon became part of Beth's extended family, and they bought several farms in Dry Creek, where Beth's family had farms. And Kelly actually farms. And he learned life lessons on the farm, which he incorporated into a brilliant Western Surgical Association presidential address. And I think the life lessons tell us a lot about Kelly. Spend time to visit before the visitation. Kelly gets to know his patients, gets to know his colleagues, gets to know his faculty. No matter how big your tractor is, you can still get it stuck in the mud. He's a very talented man, but he's very humble. His family matters. Count your blessings, not your problems. He's an optimist. The days are indeed long, but the years are indeed short. I learned a new word preparing this for Kelly, polymath. It's someone who learned much, someone who's a universal man with a lot of expertise. Your president is a skilled surgeon and teacher. You can see him enhancing his skills with the game operation. He's a warm, beloved, greatly respected chairman, always willing to drop everything and solve the residents or faculty's problems. You know, when the residents begin their internship, they're invited to the McMaster's home. They play poker with the chief. I'm not sure the residents really want to do that. A new intern to play poker with the chief, that's really a lose-lose situation. <laughs> if you lose, you lose. If you win, you lose. He was a scientist and a scholar, author, editor. Kelly reads real classical literature. In one of his presidential addresses, he referred to Aristophanes. How many of us read Aristophanes? Kelly loves dogs, started at a very early age. He seems to collect them, they gather around him. He's, he is a farmer. <laughs> he sows the seed and he farms and he gets his tractor stuck in the mud. He's a chef. He actually cooks some very complicated dishes, Beth tells me. You can see him canning tomatoes with his brother and cooking with his son, Stephen. He's an outdoorsman. He loves to take his boys out on trips and stop at the official bragging station where he often buys large fish for a photograph. <laughs> Kelly is a loving dad and a loving husband. I've been to their home and it's just tremendous hospitality and kindness. So it is my distinct pleasure, the privilege of my office, and the pleasure of my friendship to introduce to you your extraordinary president, Kelly McMasters. Well, thank you, Dr. Giuliano. That was certainly much kinder than I had uh, anticipated. When I was first elected president of the Society of Surgical Oncology, my initial reaction was one of intense pride, which very quickly gave way to a profound sense of embarrassment and humility as I realized I was being honored for the hard work and dedication of hundreds of others over the course of a couple of decades. While there's no way to appropriately thank everyone, I want to take a moment to mention a few people who have been especially helpful to me throughout the course of my career. At Colgate University, the late Dr. Roger Hoffman, and at Rutgers University, Dr. Gordon McDonald and the late Dr. William Moyle taught me to be a scientist. At the University of Louisville, Drs. Hiram Polk and David Richardson, along with Bill Cheadle and Michael Edwards, among many others, taught me to be an academic surgeon. At MD Anderson, Drs. Charles Balch and Rafe Pollack, along with 
Merrick Ross, Doug Evans, Jeff Lee, Fred Ames, Mark Rowe, Steve Curley, Peter Pisters, who's with us here in the audience, many, many others at MD Anderson. I, I can't mention them all. They taught me to be a surgical oncologist. Any measure of success I have enjoyed is certainly due to the outstanding residents, fellows, faculty, and staff at the University of Louisville, the Division of Surgical Oncology, Drs. Rob Martin, Chuck Scoggins, Michael Flynn, Amy Quillo, Nicholas Ikai, Rajesh Phillips, and Michael Egger have been a tremendous team. Many more of you in the audience, uh, too numerous to mention, have helped me in many ways from the current officers and many past presidents of the SSO to those of you who have been close colleagues, collaborators, mentors, and friends. I also want to thank Eileen Widmer and all of the SSO staff who continue to make this such a great organization. Finally, I thank my wife, Beth, my sons, uh, Austin and Stephen, and the rest of my family for allowing me to be who I am and do what I do. They understand what I am about to tell you. This will not be a conventional presidential address. After spending all of my career immersed in the analysis of data, I will not show you any data. I will not talk about surgical history, education, or training. I will not talk about basic translational or clinical research. I will not talk about cancer epidemiology, prevention, or new therapies. My talk is entitled, The Fundamental Difference Between Cancer Treatment and Patient Care. If you think they are the same thing, Perhaps I have chosen my topic wisely. Many years ago, a 58-year-old woman presented to my office with obstructive jaundice. Her workup revealed cancer of the head of the pancreas. She underwent a Whipple operation and recovered uneventfully. Her final pathology revealed poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, with negative margins and a single positive peripancreatic lymph node. She completed a course of 5-FU-based chemoradiation for a period of six weeks. Nine months after her Whipple operation, she developed a small periumbilical incisional hernia. She otherwise felt fine, had no symptoms or problems, and had returned to an active lifestyle. When I performed her ventral hernia repair, I found multiple small peritoneal nodules undoubtedly representing carcinomatosis. I repaired the hernia, but did not biopsy the nodules and did not tell the patient about the operative findings. The patient very quickly returned to her normal quality of life. She was always very cheerful, active, and involved with family activities. She became one of my favorite patients because of her wonderful attitude and appreciative nature. I continued to see her regularly in the office with no diagnostic tests or imaging studies. I fully expected her to become symptomatic relatively quickly and questioned her in detail during each office visit. However, she was completely asymptomatic and enjoying an excellent quality of life until she developed another small incisional hernia 22 months from the time of her first hernia repair. At this point, she was found to have small lung metastases. For the next 23 months, up until the time of her death, she received a succession of different chemotherapy regimens, some of which she tolerated better than others, but none of which induced a response. By failing to tell the patient at the time of her hernia repair that she had peritoneal metastasis, I gave the patient 22 months of excellent quality of life without symptoms or the knowledge that she had recurrent disease. Was this unethical, immoral, illegal? Or was it the right thing to do? I certainly have asked myself these questions many times and have come to the conclusion that it was the right thing to do. Most people, however, would criticize this as being overly paternalistic and the violation of the patient's rights. What is a reasonable plan of follow-up for patients with cancers for which early detection of metastatic disease offers no advantage? Certainly there are some types of cancer for which routine surveillance with 
tumor markers and imaging studies is warranted because reasonable salvage therapies are available that can extend survival with a good quality of life. For, in, for example, surveillance CEA levels and CT scans make sense for patients with colorectal cancer because some patients with hepatic metastasis can undergo potentially curative liver resection. However, what possible benefit can there be for early detection of asymptomatic recurrent pancreatic cancer? We all know that resection of pancreatic adenocarcinoma is almost always a palliative operation anyway. Almost all patients will eventually die of the disease. Why do we perform CT scans and blood tests every three months so we can administer palliative chemotherapy prior to the development of symptoms? Well, you can't palliate a patient who is asymptomatic. I would ask the same question for patients who have undergone resection for hyalur cholangiocarcinoma, gastric cancer, esophageal cancer, and any other type of solid tumor we resect for which there are no effective salvage therapies or for which there's no evidence that early detection of asymptomatic recurrence is any better than waiting until the patients are symptomatic. I will add one caveat. There's an important distinction between tests to detect actionable local or regional recurrence versus systemic recurrence. Surgeons are local regional disease control specialists. We sometimes cure patients only by virtue of the fact that some cancers in some patients have not progressed beyond the local and regional disease we resect. Failure of local regional disease control can cause untold misery for our patients and salvage procedures or treatments when the local regional recurrence is detected early can sometimes prevent or mitigate this misery. For solid tumors with this type of biology, remember your solemn duty as a surgical oncologist to achieve local regional disease control when possible. Q-twist, quality adjusted time without symptoms or toxicity analysis is a validated method for analyzing the impact of cancer, ther cancer therapy on quality as well as quantity of life. The idea is that many patients may not always value prolongation of life if it involves decreased quality of life related to cancer symptoms or toxicity of treatment. Certainly the best quality of life is that time during which the patient has no symptoms and no knowledge of recurrence. This is the survival time we should strive to prolong. If there are no salvage therapies that offer a reasonable chance of prolonged survival or cure when asymptomatic recurrence is found, why bother to look very hard to find bad news? Most patients have their recurrence detected because of symptoms anyway. False positive tests, especially in the era of PET CT scans, can lead to a devastating sequence of unhelpful additional studies, biopsies, and anxiety. Yet at cancer centers everywhere, there's a knee-jerk reaction to order blood tests and imaging studies every three to six months for virtually every kind of solid tumor. NCCN guidelines are all over the map. I know that further progress in the treatment of metastatic disease relies on patients entering clinical trials of new therapies. Yet I do not think we would have less accrual to clinical trials if we, if we waited for such patients to become symptomatic. For patients with cancers for which there's no good rationale for early detection of recurrence, I tell the patient that we will proceed with the assumption that you are cured of your cancer unless proven otherwise. I don't remember exactly from whom at MD Anderson I borrowed this line, but I have found it useful in counseling many patients. I've been amazed to find that almost pa all patients understand this philosophy and agree to follow this plan. I see the patients in the office regularly, weigh them, do a physical examination, and most importantly, take a little time to talk to them. I ask about their quality of life and activities and may discuss anything from fishing to family matters. Patients know that they should call immediately if they develop any new symptoms or problems between office visits. Decisions about imaging and other tests are driven by symptoms not by protocol. If the patient is not comfortable with this watchful waiting strategy, we will decide together on a reasonable surveillance plan. I could be accused of offering false hope for such patients because many will relapse and die of their cancer. 
but not all. It is hope that sustains these patients. Hope is what allows them to experience the greatest quality of life after treatment of potentially curable cancers, even if that potential is small. I think it is a laudable goal to prolong the time until the patient must face the reality of terminal disease. After all, how can we measure the value of 22 months of quality survival without symptoms or knowledge of recurrence? Consider the case of my patient, a 75-year-old widower who had just finished chopping wood in February 2010 when he noticed what he thought was blood in his urine. It turned out instead that he had dark urine from obstructive jaundice. He was found to have two separate adenocarcinomas, a T2 gallbladder cancer and a T4B duodenal cancer. He underwent uh, segment 4B and 5 liver resection, portal lymph node dissection, and a Whipple operation. Although he had negative margins of resection, he had four positive lymph nodes with ex extensive extracapsular extension. After considering adjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy, he declined to take any additional treatment. In good conscience, not even I could use my line about assuming that he was cured of his cancer unless proven otherwise. We had a frank discussion about his prognosis, and he told me that he just wanted to enjoy whatever time he had left on this earth. I saw him in the office every three months. I never checked any tumor markers or CT scans. Then every three months turned into every six months. Then every six months turned into every year. I just talked to him a few weeks ago. He said he is indeed still on this side of the dirt, and he is still kicking, although maybe not quite as high as he used to. He still does some work around the farm. He is healthy and active and has a new girlfriend. They go dancing every week and play cards with friends and do lots of other stuff. I didn't inquire further about the other stuff. <laughs> if he has recurrent cancer, he doesn't want to know about it, and neither do I. He is asymptomatic and has an excellent quality of life at 83 years of age. I was prepared to tell you many other stories of patients like this, but you get the point. As surgical oncologists, we all have patients like this and stories to tell. I know that most of the stories don't end like this, but there are a couple of lessons here. I didn't know how much time my patient had left on this earth, but whether it was eight months or eight years, I was determined that he wouldn't spend his remaining time in doctor's offices and at the hospital getting blood tests and CT scans and some unproven adjuvant therapy regimen we would have to invent. I was determined that he would have quality time without symptoms or knowledge of recurrence. He knew to call me at the first sign of any problems. It just turned out that he never needed to call. Furthermore, in this day and age of personalized cancer therapy, targeted agents, immunotherapy, multi-drug cytotoxic chemotherapy regimens, and a dozen different ways to deliver radiation therapy, it's easy to forget that the original cancer therapy is still the most effective treatment for solid tumors. In many cases, even sometimes hopeless cases, a good operation is still the single best thing we can do for our patients. Multidisciplinary treatment is generally considered to be the best approach to patient, cancer patient care, and most of the time this is certainly true. Yet how many times have you seen patients with incurable cancer who have had innumerable chemotherapy regimens and radiation therapy administered right up to the time of their demise when everyone knew these treatments were futile? Lest we start throwing stones from inside our glass house, we need to critically evaluate the value of all that is done in the name of surgical palliation as well. No matter how many times we discuss the issue of futile surgical care at, at my own departmental morbidity and mortality conference, many surgeons continue to fall into this trap, myself included. I am regularly astounded at how frequently patients and their families yearning for someone to tell them the plain truth, have encountered physicians who have made the truth so elusive. 
Sometimes what is needed is one good doctor who knows the patient well enough to help make the right decisions. This includes the decision to stop chemotherapy and institute palliative care. For some reason, it is much easier for physicians to switch to futile fourth-line chemotherapy than it is to tell the patient it's time to stop treatment. Patients are forever grateful if you tell them the truth, especially if you can summon just a touch of compassion when you deliver the bad news. I remember when I received a thoughtful handmade gift from a patient and his wife simply for calling them about a CT scan result that demonstrated recurrent, inoperable, and incurable hepatocellular carcinoma two years after his left hepatectomy. In the card that accompanied the gift, they expressed their appreciation for the fact that I had called personally in a timely manner, something that, in their experience, was rare for physicians to do. As touched as I was by this gesture of gratitude from a dying patient, it made me reflect on the times that I have not always been so diligent in promptly communicating test results. Certainly all of us can do a little better in this regard. Patients do not always expect miracles, but they appreciate even the smallest signs of concern that are easy for busy clinicians to overlook. The most challenging, but perhaps most rewarding part of being a surgical oncologist is to help ease patients over to the other side with dignity. I let my patients with incurable cancer know that if it gets to the point that further therapy will cause more harm than good, I will tell them. When it gets to that point, I do tell them. Many times, patients are relieved and just want someone to give them permission to stop treatment. The available evidence suggests that palliative supportive care enhances not only quality, but duration of life. It is imperative that we teach physicians how to initiate appropriate end-of-life discussions well before the end of life. But you might protest the patient and the family want everything done to keep fighting the cancer. This is where being a good doctor comes in. I guarantee that no one wants to watch wants to suffer from toxicity, from futile therapy, and no one wants to watch his or her family member go through this. These are the hard conversations you shouldn't avoid. This is where you can make the difference between death with dignity and death with indescribable misery. Think about the way that people talk about patients with cancer as if they were fighting a war. Patients are warriors. Patients are always battling cancer. They are told to keep on fighting cancer. They are going to beat cancer. We have even had a war on cancer. Patients who suffer through the toxicity and side effects of treatment without complaint are courageous. In Jimmy Valvano's iconic speech as he was dying of cancer, he uttered what is now the motto and a registered trademark of the Jimmy V Foundation. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. Most people take this to mean that cancer patients should never quit taking chemotherapy and other cancer treatments. Well, what happens if you decide to quit battling cancer because further treatment is toxic and without benefit? That, does that mean that you are giving up? If you complain about side effects and toxicity, are you a coward? If you accept hospice care, should you be ashamed because you surrendered? This isn't about fighting a war. It's about appropriate end-of-life cancer care. We expect cancer patients to walk through the fires of hell and back in order to live for an extra month, yet many of them just suffer the ravages of overly aggressive treatment. The true heroes are not only those who fight to the bitter end knowing that the fight is hopeless, they are those who know when it's time to accept supportive end-of-life care. It is time for us to change the conversation about appropriate care for end-stage cancer patients. Many of you from other countries do a better job of this than we do in the United States. We still have a long way to go. Forgive me if I seem to be proselytizing about this topic. You see, my family and I know a little bit about it. We know all about toxicity, palliation, and quality of life. As you just heard, my son Owen was diagnosed with T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia at, at age 11. Leukemia is a cowardly blood cancer that surgeons can't resect. Here is Owen prior to his diagnosis, a funny, outgoing, happy-go-lucky boy 
with an adorably infectious smile. He made friends easily and made everyone laugh. He loved skateboarding and snowboarding and basketball and tennis and video games. He was smarter than the rest of us and had a brilliant future ahead of him. Pediatric oncologists can push children to extreme limits of toxicity because in general, kids are a lot more resilient than adults. While there is much talk these days about using MELT, most effective, least toxic principles, in guiding therapy, I can assure you that pediatric oncologists are not afraid of toxicity. The general strategy appears to be to throw every possible active chemotherapeutic agent at these kids in the hope that the child is tougher than the cancer. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Owen underwent over four years of continuous therapy, including innumerable cycles of systemic chemotherapy and intrathecal therapy, neutropenia and sepsis, countless days and nights in a pediatric hospital. In oncology, we grade toxicity on a scale of one to five and consider that anything less than about four is acceptable. Considering that grade five toxicity is a polite way of saying dead, I'm not certain that the doctors and patients would always agree on what is acceptable toxicity. This is what toxicity looks like when it is your own child. Every time Owen had a bone marrow biopsy, which was frequently, we would wait on pins and needles until we got the result, the heartbreaking cycle of apparent remission followed by relapse. He eventually underwent bone marrow transplantation. His cancer came back only a few months later. We knew that everything from here on out was palliative treatment, even when we pretended otherwise. We were able to keep his disease under control for many months. When his cancer became refractory to less toxic treatments, I advocated for liposomal vincristine because I read a study that showed a meaningful response rate for his type of cancer in this situation. The, the toxicity was supposedly acceptable. Here is Owen before re, just before receiving this treatment when he had a sleepover Christmas party with all of his friends at our house that turned into quite a teenage bash. By all accounts, they had a great time. Here's what liposomal vincristine did to him within a couple of weeks. You see, I did to my own son what I promised my patients I won't let happen to them. I was tempted by the false hope of futile therapy. So now you have a choice. You can be a surgical oncologist who cuts out cancer and delegates the decisions about appropriate follow-up testing and palliative care to others, or you can be a good doctor and do the right thing. You can avoid the difficult conversations, or you can understand the fundamental difference between cancer treatment and patient care. This audience is filled with those who have devoted their lives to the care of patients with cancer. Also within this audience are those who have, and more importantly, those who will perform the innovative research that will relieve suffering, improve quality of life, extend survival, and cure more patients of cancer. The revolution in immunotherapy has already led to a miraculous cure for some patients with previously incurable B-cell leukemia, melanoma, and other cancers. These miracles only happen because of the single-minded dedication of those who pursue cancer research. To the young people in the audience, the future of our specialty, Owen would want you to be inspired to pursue this dream of hope for patients with cancer. The dream of the day when the most effective cancer treatments will not be measured by their maximally tolerated dose. The war on cancer will not be won in the operating room. It will be won in the research laboratory, and in the clinical trials office. So don't give up. Don't ever give up trying to find cures for cancer. Thank you for allowing me to be SSO president. It's been the greatest honor of my career.